You've missed out on a bunch of shit. I'm sure I'll say it again. Okay? So, so you, bless you. You okay over there? Sure. No dropping dead. And it's, it's that time of year for people to start having allergies attacks, right? It's great fun. Uh, that's, your, that's your exocytic process happening. Right? That is a beautiful thing. That is rabs, coats, and snares. Oh, no. my. <laughs> can always count on you. Thank you. Uh, I take it back. It's rabs and snares because those vesicles are already made and waiting. There's no coat. They just bind and fuse and dump out histamines. And what do you take? Antihistamines. Antihistamines. Okay. So every time you sneeze, just think, there's cell biology in action. <laughs> Yay. So, so... Ben's, cytoskel Ben's skeleton is holding him up, his regular skeleton. What is, what is your skeleton doing, Nicole? Number, you should be one. One, two, three, there's four. Four, you've moved. Five, is there more than five? Only five? Okay, well that's sad. Okay. It or no, we're not talking about cells at all. We're talking about your skeleton. The whole thing. What's your skeleton do? You're saying almost the same thing. Okay. Let me ask you, would right, your heart be in your foot? Could it be in your foot? It helps organize the organs in your body. We hang organs off of our skeleton. It's like a Christmas tree. Right? You can do this at home next year for Christmas. Put up a skeleton and hang some a really nice heart and some lungs, a little pancreas. Yeah, see? Now I got nerdy girl. Nerdy Nicole number two is going to do that next year. But think of the bling you can put on it, right? Okay, so it helps organize organs, okay? And probably the most important thing is it really does help you move. How do things that don't have a skeleton move? So if we're talking about bacteria, they could have a flagella. What else? Cilia. I mean, the movement is very different. It's a different process. And all three of these activities... What's that? I'm sorry. What'd you say? I got it. Good. We're good. Her keys are there. She knows they're there. Sorry, I thought you were adding. All right. They really? It was ADD again. Uh, so these three things, we're going to talk about how they work inside of a cell as well. You need to hold things in place in a cell. You, cells move things all the time from one place to another in a cell. That's what I'm interested in. My whole research process is how things move from one place to another. And they help to create the shape of the cell. I put this picture here. Um, you know, it's really not telling you anything more than what I already just said. The three different kinds of filaments, intermediate microtubules and actin filaments, sometimes you'll see that they call actin filaments, there's another word they use, microfilaments or something like that, micro. And the reason is because these are the smallest of the three filaments. And guess what this one is? The large. Middle. <laughs> it's the middle. It's the intermediate size, and microtubules are the largest. <laughs> and most of you know microtubules from what structure? The spindle complex when cells are doing division. So the spindle complex at division is made up of microtubules, but that, those microtubules are being used in a very specific circumstance. You have microtubules all day, every day, that are being used in your cells. So they have a 24-7, uh, 365 function in addition to, oh, it's time to divide. Okay? Um, microtubules are also, so this, this picture is a spindle complex, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It has chromosomes <coughs> in the middle. Uh, microtubules are also what we hang organelles on. And we'll talk about that 
Intermediate filaments are the oddball in the group. All right, they're made totally different than the other two filaments. And they are all about structure. They keep things, and they're very strong. They don't, they're not made and destroyed very quickly. They're like permanent structures. Whereas both microtubules and actin filaments, they're very dynamic. So they can be made, and we call that polymerized. They can be, right, polymers can be added one after another. But they can also be depolymerized really quickly. Okay? And actin, these small ones, okay, they really help in cell shape and cell movement. And we're going to... Uh, the actin filaments that you guys know about, does anybody know what the structure is here on the bottom? That's muscle, okay? Almost all of you have seen that somewhere in your lifetime in science. Mm -hmm. And what is that structure called? <coughs> muscle fiber. Muscle fiber. It's got a name. Starts with an S. Striated. That's striated muscle. Still got another name. Sarc a sarcomere. Very good. Who said that? Yay for sarcomeres. And... You know, this is an EM picture. You can see light and dark. What do you know about light and dark in an EM picture? Oh, yeah. Electron, Electron dense. dense. So the things that are dense are very proteinaceous. The things that are light have less protein involved. All right? Now, if I said that to you, and I said to you, actin is a microfilament, where do you think actin would be, light or dark? Right? Because you don't know what it's made of and you don't really know what the structure is, you're just guessing. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just tell you, it's the light. Okay? And I'm going to, we'll, we'll do that in, in really in depth because everybody loves to learn about how your muscles work. Okay? About all of these in gory detail. Um, I'm going to add. So we kind of have to go through a little bit of the, the nuts and bolts of this about how all of these filaments are made. Now, I just said to you that intermediate filaments are really strong and stable, and um, they don't get polymerized and depolymerized quickly. The other two, microtubules and actin, really fast. They can be made, and then they can be depolymerized. It doesn't matter what we're talking about, whether it's the intermediate filaments or the other two. They're all held together by weak, non-covalent interactions. Which means that we're going to take a bunch of subunits and put them together, right? This is, here's a subunit, here's a subunit, here's a subunit. You're putting together a bunch of subunits, and they're strung together by non-covalent interactions. Think of a brick. You have a brick, and then you have another brick, and another brick, and another brick, and another brick, and another brick. Right? If you put those all together, how strong is that string of bricks? I'm sorry, and you're going to put a little cement in between, and that's okay. going to be your non-covalent interaction. It's pretty strong. It's absolutely not strong. <laughs> Have you ever had a string of bricks, just one string of bricks? Oh. It's really easy to break that apart. Why? Well, there's, right, so all you have to do is really smash it in the middle, and it'll easily break. So how do we put together bricks? We stagger them. And so you're going to see that there's what happens in some of these microfilaments and microtubules and intermediate filaments. It's about how the proteins get organized that creates the stability. Does that make sense? All right. Yes? Uh, you said earlier that uh, the actin filaments were the one that depolymerized really quickly. But now you say microtubules and actin both polymerize and depolymerize very quickly. Oh, earlier you say actin filaments. Oh wait. No, you said actin filaments are permanent structures. Nope. Intermediates are really permanent. Actin and microtubules are really dynamic. All right, I I can't even go into all of the accessory proteins. Okay, I'm going to keep it to the minimum, but I want you to have it in the back of your head, right? We can only learn so much in here. You could spend a whole 
course on just cytoskeleton, probably on just actin. Okay, we're going to spend a couple lectures just doing everything. So, what are things that are going to be involved? So, this is this idea that <clears throat> if we have a bunch of filaments that we put together, it creates a stronger structure. And in this one, what they're basically saying is, okay, it's harder to break apart this structure than it might be to take one individual off of an end. And that's what's going to happen in these dynamic filaments that we're going to talk about. You can add and remove from the ends really easily. Actually, much more easily than you could by breaking it apart and adding elsewhere. Okay? It's like when you're building a wall, you don't, <laughs> you don't build from the outside in, do you? If you do, you're a moron because you get to the middle and then you have to get a wet saw to cut your brick. Because, oh, I only need a brick this big instead of the regular size. Has anybody ever used a wet saw? Yeah. That's fun stuff, man. If you haven't done, if you have not done this, you should use it. Just once in your lifetime. Okay? So, the idea here is we're going to start building these. All right, we're going to build them. And if you start with a subunit here, where can you add? On either side. Okay, and then where can I add? On either side. Add, add, add. But I can also remove. And you see how that can go quickly if you're adding and removing from both ends? Mm -hmm. Okay. I have to tell you, this is one of the hard tricks for students to understand. The stability is not due to just the interactions. The stability is going to have to do with the actual proteins that we're going to use. These are all made up of proteins. So actin is a protein, okay, and it's a small globular protein. Does that protein have sides? Yes. Absolutely. What did I just draw? I just drew for you an amino acid sequence, yes, that ended up looking like a globular protein. That's an amino acid sequence. It has sides. It actually has things that are on this side that are different than are on this side. Oops, blue won't work. Right? Very different. Think of it as a tennis ball that has two colors. Okay? Orange on one side, yellow on the other. If you start putting together orange, yellow, orange, yellow, orange, yellow, orange, yellow, one side is always going to have orange on it. The other side is always going to have yellow assuming that they bind to one place. And that's how we're going to start building these proteins together. Intermediate filaments are really easy to understand this because they have a very long structure and they link together in a particular way that creates the brick effect, that whole overlapping effect. Okay, and the overlapping thing is why they are totally stable. Actin and microtubules, they just add on the ends. So they're less stable. All right, here's another myth. I got to just, I, I'm trying to give you all of the things that trip students up. Polar or nonpolar? What the fuck does polar mean? Anybody? Sides. Sides. In this case, it means sides. What, do, what else does it mean? Difference in charge. This is not going to mean difference in charge here. And it gets even worse because we're not just going to call them polar and nonpolar. They're going to have a plus n and a minus n. I didn't do this. I promise you this was not my doing. The plus n and the minus n have nothing to do with charge. I apologize now for this. Okay, so Courtney had the idea of polar and nonpolar right on, on, on point. Different sides. So when I said we were taking an orange and yellow, and an orange and yellow, and an orange and yellow, and an orange and yellow, if you make a filament like that, that filament has orange on one end, yellow on the other. They're different ends. Okay, that's polar. It means that it has different ends. Nonpolar means the ends are the same. Okay. Nonpolar is going to be intermediate filaments. 
That means the ends look the same. Polar is going to be microtubules and actin. Intermediate filaments do not have plus and minus ends. Only the dynamic ones are going to have the plus and minus ends. And I'll explain plus and minus. Yes? When you say the same, do you mean the same amino acid or? The same structure. You'll see. In one second, it'll be, it'll just become like, oh, I get it. Okay. Lost, you should be. That's where we are. We should be in the lost stage. Yes? You said the filaments were nonpolar. The micro, the, so microtubules and actin are polar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Intermediate filaments are nonpolar. Intermediate filaments don't have plus and minus. Okay. Intermediate filaments are the weirdos, as far as this is concerned. So we'll just start with one, and I'll explain the structure, and hopefully then this will become clear. All right, let's start with microtubules. Okay, they're polar. They're made up of proteins. Cleverly, the proteins are called tubulin. Why is that clever? Microtubules, they call the protein tubulin. But there's two different forms of tubulin, alpha tubulin and beta tubulin. Why do we have different forms? What do we call those? Isoforms. Isoforms. So they're the same structure, but slightly different, which means they're going to have a slightly different function. And the way microtubules are put together is there's always an alpha and beta bound to each other. Okay, there's always an alpha and beta. And when you start putting, and how are alpha and beta connected? Non-covalent. Non okay. Now, every time we go to put together a microtubule, you have to have an alpha and a beta. So here's an alpha and a beta. We're going to add an alpha and a beta. <coughs> there's another alpha and a beta. You want to be an alpha and a beta? There we go. We're putting together... A microtubule. Now, that is one individual filament of alpha and betas. What they're showing you here is one individual filament of alpha and beta. So they're saying alpha is green, beta is green. Dark green. Dark green. <laughs> yeah, they could have made it a different color, made it easier. Light green, dark green, light green, dark green. Those are alpha betas. But a microtubule isn't made up of one string. It's made up of 13. So you have 13 strings of alpha betas. Do you see how that might add to stability in the structure? So now you have lateral connections between the structures, between the filaments. So each one of these is called a filament. And it actually has a name. It's called a protofilament. That's going to come up multiple, multiple, multiple times. Okay, protofilaments. So you need 13 protofilaments to make a microtubule. Right? I, I like to think of microtubules as, you know those pool noodles? Yeah. You know those styrofoamy kind of pool noodle things? That's what a microtubule is. It actually does have a little bit of a hollow center to it. It's flexible. All right, and that flexibility is important. Um, and then to, to just add insult to injury, we're going we're gonna to say that both alpha tubulin and beta tubulin bind to GTP. I love GTP. Are you sick? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you're sitting all by yourself. I feel like, I feel like you've... She's isolated. Zilla has isolated herself. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. People, people do appreciate that. Do not share. Sharing is not caring in this case. Um, what, is, what is good about GTP? What is GTP? Energy. Yes, but no in this case. Okay. Okay? So when we talk about GTP binding to a protein, what does that do? Yeah. Turns on. Turns on. Changes the conformation. Yes. Thank you. 
Two, two of you. Oh, no, no, not you. Back. You pointed back. Yeah. Nicole, okay. number three. <laughs> Changes the conformation. Okay. GTP is a source of energy. It can be energy. But in this case, it's not being used as energy. I heard Ben say, it turns things on and turns things off. And when, when you say that, Ben, what does that mean? It means it's binding and it's changing the conformation. That's all, that's all that means, okay? When we say it's turning something on, we were talking about RABS originally with GTP binding. Mm -hmm. Okay, turning it on meant it changed the conformation into a conformation that could bind other stuff. So turning it off means that it can't bind. All right, well, so these filaments are going to bind to GTP, and they do it in a particular way. The alpha tubulin binds, so I'm just going to write on this slide because I can. The alpha tubulin is always bound to GTP, and the beta tubulin, okay, can actually cycle between GTP and GDP. What that means is the alpha tubulin, all right, protects that GTP and doesn't let it be hydrolyzed. What did I say? What was that I said? Right, so that GTP is now in a pocket that it can't be, the phosphate can't be cleaved off. That's weird. And then what's even weirder about that is if you think about the structure we just looked at, of 13 protofilaments, did you notice that the protofilaments were all lined up the same direction? What does that mean when I say that, same direction? Oh! <laughs> when I point to you and you look behind you, I know that's not a good sign. What does it mean they're lined up in the same direction? How were they directional in the first place? We didn't talk about plus and minus ends yet, did we? We didn't talk about which end was, right? We did say they were polar and not, they were polar. But what's different about the ends? They're different. How are they different? One's beta and one's alpha. One's alpha and one's beta. So all the alphas are on the bottom, at least in the picture, and all the betas are on the top. Right? So it's always alpha, beta, alpha, beta, alpha, beta, alpha, beta. You can't just go alpha, beta, alpha, beta, alpha. It doesn't happen. So that means that on the ends of a microtubule, you're going to have an alpha, which is always bound to GTP. But on the other end, you're always going to have a beta that can be switching back and forth between GTP to GDP. Yes, ma'am? Are there always the same amount of pairs like for each protofilament? Does it have the same amount of pairs? So the, the picture, there's right. like one that's longer. One that's there, these are going to be being polymerized as fast as you can imagine. And so they're almost always going to be the same approximate length. Okay. But when they start to, so you always are going to write add, it's all about is it simultaneous. I'm sure it's not simultaneous in every okay. instance, but they're going to be close. Yes? The way I looked at the picture, and I was confused at first, it looked like it's spiraling up, and maybe all the alphas are binding to alphas, and all the betas are binding to more betas. So, but they're not. They're, they're in a line like this, and it's, it's line, 13 it is, lines so. like this, but they also have side-to-side -side interaction. What kind of interactions? Weak non-covalent. Weak non-covalent. Okay? So a filament that has one, one filament... That one protofilament is not going to be very strong. This one has 13. All right? That's really strong. Guess what actin is going to have? Remember, it's the smallest. It's going to have two. Not as strong. Guess how many intermediate filaments are going to have? 32. 32 of these, <coughs> side by side, really strong, okay? This picture, I love this picture. This is a flagella. And what's in a flagella? Microtubules. So flagella in humans, where are they? 
swimming, swimming, swimming. This is what gets you pregnant. Okay. Each one of these is a microtubule. And these microtubules, right, can move. And that's what allows for the movement of the flagella. So these need to be structurally sound. If your microtubules are not structurally sound, you have poor swimmers. Okay, that means you can practice a lot and not have to worry. <laughs> okay. Now, I told you, right, this is a very special circumstance where microtubules are used. The spindle complex, very special circumstance where microtubules are used. But 24-7, 365, every single cell in your body, I'm saying that and now I'm, I'm hesitating. Because every time I say every single one, I'm wrong. I'm, I'm worried about... Um, I'm worried about red blood cells, I'm worried because red blood cells are very strange cells. So every other cell other than perhaps a red blood cell has a microtubule organizing center. MTC. MTOC. MTOC. Oh, jeez, man. I almost got it. You were so close. And what's interesting about this is why do you need a microtubule organizing center? Ooh. Oh, it's my turn in Words with Friends. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so there is a do not disturb thing. Apparently, I can't remember to use it. Because then when I turn it on, I forget to turn it off, and then I don't know, and I haven't played, and they're like, where are you? <laughs> they, just can't, they just can't wait for me to beat them. I've only chosen two people to play with, and I keep beating them. <laughs> people that I was losing to, I'm just okay, I'm not. <laughs> ben? I want to play. You want to play? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh! Okay, I got it. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's an app that you have to know about. Okay. Quiz Up. It's awesome. Yes. I love it. So, so Quiz Up, right, is this, this app. It's free. Free is good, yes. Everybody likes free. It's the best number in the world. And there's a whole biology section. And you can play people across the world. Yeah. And really so, good. and you can just pick a random opponent, and that ran, and you don't have to play. It's not. It doesn't have to be synchronous, so you don't have to be online at the same time. You can just, if you pick anybody across the world, okay, it's at the same time. So that's kind of cool. And they give you a question, and like multiple choice, and it's all about how fast you answer. Okay. So I play. With Gerard. I don't know if you guys oh, know Gerard. Who yes. Like him. Just, and that motherfucker beats me every single yeah. time <laughs> because he's fast, okay? Like, you get 10 seconds to answer the question, and literally, he gets it on, on the first second. first second. He doesn't even use a second. I know the answer, but I'm so paranoid now that I'm not going fast enough that I start picking wrong. Yeah. Good. Reading so, the question. Reading the question is important. So I highly recommend that you just play that in your spare time. You cannot go wrong with learning biology with a game. That is more fun than anything. The then questions are really good, too. The questions are not bad. Um, there's all sorts of other topics. Like you can do, yeah. like, there's television. Television and music theory and everything you can imagine. <laughs> quiz up. Look it up, OK? Look up Quiz Up. And if you really get adventurous, Email me and, and, and ask to play me. <laughs> a, student, a student sent me a, a, a thing. Uh, all my friends dared me to challenge you to a game. I'm like, all right, whatever. I don't care. I'll play anybody. And I lose a lot. <laughs> but I, it keeps me coming back, right? All right. Now, getting back to, did you have a question or were you going to talk about quiz up? No, I was going to say you were. Who? You did? It's Arika. It's Arika, and I beat her. <laughs> yeah, because we messed her up. I know. That was good. So there was a whole group of them. They're all in Phi E, which is the fraternity, sorority, whatever what do you call it. <laughs> it's a co ed medical fraternity, which I happen to now be the advisor of. Yay. <laughs> which means nothing, okay? <laughs> For me. It means like they say, can we do this? I'm like, oh, whatever, I don't care. <laughs> All right. 
So, so getting back to this, 24-7, 365, your cells have to have microtubules organized in a particular way so that it helps organize the cell. Does anybody know where the MTOC starts? You guys add it. Say the name. Centro. The other one. Centrosome. <laughs> Have you heard of a centrosome? No? Really? Yes. How about a centriole? Everybody's heard of centrioles. Okay, if I were going to draw this. Okay, so, so this picture is showing you, right, a centrosome. Okay, can everybody see this? So what kind of microscopy are they using here? This is not electron microscopy. This is fluorescence microscopy. So they've labeled, there's a couple different ways you can do this, right? You can actually label the protein itself. And what protein would they label if we were looking at this? Alpha or beta tubulin. Okay, so either they could label the alpha or beta tubulin and express it in a cell with a GFP. What's GFP? Green, Green fluorescent protein, and where'd that come from? Jellyfish. jellyfish. Alright. So we've just taken that gene from jellyfish. We don't have that gene, Mr. Muselli. Okay. And they've taken that gene and they can just link it to the gene for alpha or beta tubulin, express that in a cell, and voila. So why, what is all this stuff out on the edge? Is this, does this look like the spokes on the wheel I just told you about? Yes. Kinda. It's not all organized like I did because I can't possibly draw that. But this is what it looks like. It is filling up the cell, okay? This is one of the things, when we talk about the cell, I always draw it as this big empty space. It's not empty. It's filled with things. All right, and one of the nice things about this is we can treat cells with a drug called nicotazole, and we're going to talk about different drugs, but when we treat with nicotazole, all of a sudden, what happens to the microtubules? Where'd they go? Well, they're not there anymore. They actually depolymerize and end up as subunits. So what you're seeing in the plus nicotazole image are the subunits that are in the cytosol. Why would we want to do that? Is nicotazole something that's good for you? No. no. What would happen to the cell? You'd be dead. But, but we use it in the lab as a tool. You might want to think about creating for yourself a list of tools and techniques that could be used in cell biology. Why would that be good, Donna? So you know what to avoid. Yes, don't be eating any nicotazole. What about, what about for your grade in this course? You might get a question, like, how would you examine this? How do you know, how do we know that lysosomes are attached to microtubules? What happens, this is a great question, what happens to lysosomes when you treat a cell with nicotazole? Where are lysosomes? Attached to the centrioles. Attached to the microtubules. Where in the cell? There's a there's a place that I just. It's the same place that the MTOC is. Where? Perinuclear. Okay, you're gonna become scientists. You're all gonna speak the lingo. All right, perinuclear. Lysosomes are perinuclear. Where are early endosomes? Early endosomes are at the periphery of the cell. Yes? And as we go down the endocytic pathway, we get closer to the nucleus. <coughs> okay, now I've treated a cell with the cortisol. Where are those lysosomes going to end up? Anywhere. Everywhere. They can now float around anywhere. Is that good? No. <laughs> no, it's part of a pathway. Okay? All right. All right, here's Here's a cell. Once again, a circular cell. 
You should be able to draw all of this now, right? You should be pros. What am I drawing? ER and nucleus. <laughs> okay, tired. <laughs> Where do you think the centrosome is located? Center. So it's actually what we call perinuclear. What's perinuclear? Near the nucleus. And the centrosome, centrosome contains how many centrioles? Two. Two. Two centrioles. I can't write all that. And what's really interesting, so this is way bigger than they're supposed to be. The centrioles, each of these is a centriole. They're supposed to be sort of oblong. That one's a little big. They're perpendicular to one another. Okay, you might ask me why. That's the God question that we can't answer. Can't know why. It's be that's because that's what it looks like. Uh, they sit like that. Okay, and this is where. So this is called. If it had, it doesn't have a membrane around it. Okay, so I'm just going to sort of make a dotted line. That structure is the centrosome. They are held together by something, but it's not a membrane. It's some sort of maybe sugary material that's holding the centrioles together. Okay? And what happens is from those centrioles, from the centrosome, microtubules emanate out from, sorry, from there. How can they go across the nucleus? What am I doing? Over. It's over or under. Okay, they don't go through as though I've drawn it, right? They go over the nucleus or under the nucleus. But they all look like this. And what does this look like to you? Here we go. Bicycle wheel. They look like spokes on a wheel. Thank you. That's, that drawing of a bicycle is not good. Okay, I'm not giving up my day job, okay? Pretty sure there's something wrong with that picture. <laughs> but these look like spokes on a wheel. And right, what is the purpose of spokes on a wheel? Structure. Stability and structure. What happens when you break a spoke? The whole thing is messed up. Has anybody ever broken a spoke? Yes. Yeah. Breaking one spoke isn't bad. When you break three or four, the whole wheel collapses, okay, and you're in a big crash, and then you have, like, a broken jaw, and <laughs> you're missing teeth, okay? So structurally, this is going to allow for support, and some organelles are attached to this. Anybody want to take a guess what organelle might be attached to the, to the microtubules? Golgi. The Golgi is absolutely attached to microtubules. That's pretty ugly Golgi. It's as good as I it's as good as it gets, people. Okay. Right. So the Golgi is attached. And another one that is attached that we know of is the lysosome. Okay. So structurally this is gonna matter. Now these Microtubules have ends. They have a plus end and a minus end. And the plus ends are at the periphery. So each one of these, right, this is the plus end. Which means that the minus ends are at the MTOC, right? So those two things are, are um, synonymous, centrosome and MTOC. So the MTSC has all the negatives, all the minus ends, and right, not negative, but you know what I'm talking about. Yes, Mr. Alpha, Muselli. Is the alpha or beta negative? Is the alpha or beta negative? Did anybody happen to notice on the slide? The alpha is the minus end. <coughs> so alpha is the minus end, and the beta is the plus end. Technically. <laughs> Yes? So is there only one MTOC in every cell? There is only one. That's an excellent question. Angelica's online here with what we're doing because we have one MTOC.
see we have one center zone. And I see the wheels turning in Angelica's head, okay? Because she knows that during mitosis, that doesn't seem right. Right? So when we make the spindle complex, how many MTOCs are there? Two. two. There's two. So one of the first things that happens is that you have to duplicate your center zone. When do you duplicate? <coughs> we'll get to it. It's in this class. If you want to look it up ahead of time, that's fine. If you don't want to look it up ahead of time, that's fine too. So we actually duplicate the center zone when we're undergoing mitosis. Okay? Good. Do I need to go back a slide? Or was I done? What was I doing? Oh, Lord. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about actin. Okay. Actin filaments. I said to you that I should put the light back on. Sleepiness happens in the dark. Some sleepiness happens in the light. I feel really bad when you guys are sleeping because I kind of know what that means. It means you're just freaking exhausted, okay? Weekends are hard. You have to come back to school to recover from your weekends, I know. Um, <laughs> Nicotazole, yes. So it's breaking everything up into little pieces, and those pieces are like dispersed everywhere? Yep. Yep, okay. exactly. So the nicotazole, it causes the depolymerization of the filaments. And it does that by binding to the subunits and not allowing them to bind to one another. So now this, right, 13 of these are going to take off from the plus and the minus end. Isn't that also an antifungal medication? Uh, I don't think this is antifungal. But I think your all is. Okay, it you look it up and tell me. Well, I, someone, a doctor prescribed it. This is like a cream. It's not, I don't think it's nicotazole. No, no, no. It's it, mycotazole. No, it was definitely a, Can you look it up yeah, for me? Yeah, I'll look it up. Okay. If you don't know for sure... Okay. And I have no idea. The two of us are not really talking about anything useful, are we? Okay. <laughs> Just saying. Okay. You don't need a lot of nicotazole to make that happen. It turns out it does, but it, you know, drugs like this they go a long way. You have to do a titration on the cells to find out what is the right amount to use. But now it's been done billions of times. So you just look up in the literature and say, oh yeah, I'm going to use this amount of nicotazole. Too much? Kills the cell. Off the bat. Without right, having time to see the fact that you depolymerize the microtubules. Okay, can we switch gears and talk a little bit about actin? Yes. Yes, I knew you were so excited about that. Okay, so actin is made up of a protofilament of globular actins. Actin, 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 actin. They call it G-actin. G is globular. It's just a protein, okay. just like alpha tubulin and beta tubulin. Globular actin, look what it does, it binds ATP. Okay. So the beauty of this is, this is similar, what's the purpose of the ATP? Sean has it, he says change the conformation. So, and these actins, okay, they're going to be able to hydrolyze ATP to ADP, right, and each one of them is the same, so you're going to have, right, a whole string of these that can change structure. And I said that you need two sets of these to make an actin filament. So one of them is considered a protofilament. How many did you need for a protofilament for the tubulins? Three. Three. No, protofilament? Okay, one. you need one. Okay, and the only reason I'm telling you this is because it's going to be different for intermediate filaments. Sorry. <laughs> Think of it as how many of the same things do you have to put together to get the final product? Right? So you need two of these. They're exactly, right, the same. And these are parallel, and so they're polar. Remember, if I said this was yellow, red, yellow, red, yellow, red as a tennis ball, you would have yellow on one end, red on the other. There's a plus end and a minus end based on that. We still haven't described what the plus and the minus means. I think of this like string, right? The more, the more strands that you put in a string, the stronger it is. All right, if you have one, that's useless. Two, okay, it's a little better. 
13? Yay. These are, again, immunofluorescence images. And what you're seeing here, these are called stress fibers, but they're in cells all, the, all over the place. And even though this looks, does that look organized? It kind of does, okay? To me, this looks organized. It looks like they're all going the same direction, but that's not necessarily true. I'll show you another picture where you'll see. They're just all over the place. It's, it's like pickup sticks, right, when you do pickup sticks. Does everybody know what pickup sticks are? Yeah. How many people don't know what pickup sticks are? Oh. It's a great game as a child to play pickup sticks. It's all it's a bunch of long skinny uh, pieces of wood that are they're they're made for this game. You throw them down and you the object is you need to pick up a stick and not move any of the other sticks. If you move any of the other sticks, you lose. So it's not a time waster. As kids, <laughs> what are we doing? What, what's the lesson learned for kids in that game? Fine motor skills. You're, you're, you're developing motor skills. Okay? You're developing the ability for kids to manipulate things that are small in a delicate way. Right? Have you ever seen how kids do things? <laughs> <laughs> My grandson was over on Saturday. I mean, the house is freaking destroyed. Right? <laughs> And the dogs love it because, like, the potato chips, they're everywhere. They're all over the floor. The dogs are searching everywhere. Because it's hard to get a potato chip in your mouth, as it turns out, as a child. <laughs> Even, I mean, watching him eat is, like, a fascinating thing. He had, I don't know what this, it's some sort of um, Hispanic soup that has noodles, and it's a red sauce of some kind. Fideo. There it is, Fideo. Is it with a B? F. F. Fideo. Okay, so Victoria loves Fideo. I don't like Fideo. <laughs> don't eat Fideo. But the baby loves Fideo. But the noodles, all over his face. I mean, like, I'm like, is he saving them for later or what? <laughs> Pick up sticks. So this isn't a very, this, these are all sort of lined up. So I just, I want to give you the idea that sometimes you can see them look like this, but most of the time they're just, the word I like to use is cattywampus. Okay, cattywampus means crazy. Okay. These are actin, this is also actin, and this actin is called something different. This is the edge of a cell, okay, and this is called cortical actin. So I'd like you to know those names, so cortical versus stress fibers. They're the same structure. They're the same globular actin linked together into two protofilaments put together into an actin, but they do different things. So what is this doing? What is the cortical actin? What's corti cortical mean? What's the cortex? The Cortex, when, whenever you hear the word cortex in any, any type of biology, think of the edges. So right, your brain, the cortex is the top part. Okay, in an, in an organ or an organelle, the cortex is around the edge. So often what that means, the cortex is all about the structure. Okay? Mm, so the cortical actin isn't what moves, actually. Okay. All right, these guys, these stress fibers, they're more about things moving inside the cell. We'll talk more about that. So, so this is an EM picture that I just wanted to give you the idea. This is what we're really talking about on the inside of a cell. This is showing cortical actin. So there's cortical actin around the edge, which you can't really tell the difference between actin and microtubules and intermediate filaments in this picture. Uh, somebody who has done this for a long time could. Like this is probably actin, this really skinny one here, whereas like this one is probably a microtubule. And you see some places where there's lots of blobs. And those lots of blobs are proteins that bind to these particular filaments. Around the cortical actin,
and there's a lot of proteins that bind to the cortical actin, helping keep shape. <laughs> Do you believe me that we're not empty? Our cells are not empty? Are you getting that idea? Yes. Does that mean like uh, rabs and things that move around, they use these as like highways, like traverse along? So uh, some things are going to move, move on these just like highways. And that's a great analogy because, okay, microtubules, really easy to figure out where you're going, yes? Okay, if you hop on a microtubule, you know where you're going. If you have actin and it's all over the place, all right, and it has ends, how do you really know where you're going and how do you get back if you need to? So there's going to be, we're going to have a whole lecture on molecular motors. Hmm. There are motors that allow for the movement on these filaments. And the motors attach to things like RABs or RAB-associated proteins so that it can grab a vesicle and move a vesicle. Have any of you seen the Harvard animation inside the cell? I'll send you the link, okay? But somebody actually made this beautiful animation of things moving in cells. And you're going to see a motor. And the motor moves like this. It moves, it has two heads, and one head moves like it walks. Okay? And it's attached, so the motor is attached to a long filament, and the filament is attached to a vesicle and it's dragging a vesicle along. And that's how vesicles move inside of cells. It's the coolest shit ever. <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna be able to make animations like that, but it's never gonna happen. All right. I think what I wanna do is I wanna take the last couple minutes for you to do a Moodle upload, okay? What we've learned so far, if you just open a page, right? Just add a new page to your, to your thing, and List the three filaments and what you know about the three filaments. Okay, so you're going to clearly see a difference between what we did in the beginning and at the end, right? And let's upload that. You have seven minutes. Don't miss the deadline, please, because it's a royal pain in my ass. And help each other if you need to, right? I mean, I, I, I just want to make sure, don't just copy off of somebody, but I want you to, what did we just say? What do you know about microtubules? What do you know about intermediate filaments? What do you know about active? Yeah. Do you feel like you know more? Yeah. I'm glad. That makes me happy. are so quiet. You can talk. And if you get really ambitious, draw me destruction.
haven't gotten there yet, but I want to I want to at least see that we've made progress. And I'm still working on that form to send out to you guys about iPad shit, so I'll, I'll just send that out. It requires that I actually use my computer, which makes me mad. I want to just do everything on my iPad. Are you doing okay today? Good. It looks like shit. Where's your suit, man? I'm now expecting the suit every day. How are you doing? You doing good? Very good. What are these guys made of? that way anyway. Yeah, right. 